I feel as if I'm standing on holy ground here, and if you weren't so close, I would probably be taking my shoes off. I don't know if there are such a thing as Scottish giants, but if there are, I feel as if I'm following in the footsteps of a couple of them, uh, Clan Chief Ferguson and <laughs> Clan Chief McBeg. And I feel like, you know, wee Jimmy bringing up the rear here. <laughs> but it is a great privilege to be here this evening. Thank you so much for the invitation, Chris, to bring to you some teaching on a subject that's very near uh, to my own heart uh, through pastoral experience, but also through the suffering of people very close to me as well. One of Dr. Sproul's great ministry themes has been the sovereignty of God, that God rules over all and works all things together for the good of those who love Him. And what I'd like to do this evening is I'd like to highlight for you how God can even work depression together for good to those who love Him. I could come here this evening and maybe try and talk about the whole subject of depression, the condition, the complexity, the causes, the cures, the caregivers, but I only have 35 minutes, and you can get that from my little book. So what I thought I'd do instead was just focus in on this one area, how God uses depression to teach His people so many valuable lessons. And I thought I'd do that by bringing to you a number of film clips. Over recent months, I've been involved in putting together a documentary, DVD curriculum type of thing, to accompany my book, Christians Get Depressed Too. And we interviewed a number of Christians and Christian counselors, Christians who've suffered with depression and those who've counseled them. And we're hoping to put together a resource that will help the church minister to those who are depressed and also help the depressed themselves. And the church has not been really that good at this. My own book is it's sort of a very logical, systematic treatment of depression. What the film does, hopefully, is it sort of put a human face on this suffering. And, and I hope that both of these together will impact the church and give the church a heart and skill in ministering to those of God's people who suffer in this way. So, among the number of um, questions that we asked people, and we interviewed a, a wide range of Christians, uh, different genders, different ages, uh, different races, different social classes. Uh, one of the questions we asked them all was, uh, what did you learn through this? Uh, what, what good did God bring out of this in your own experience? And we were quite amazed. I went back through all the, the five episodes a few weeks ago, and I've, I've clipped out a number of little excerpts where these Christians and those who counsel them uh, speak of all that God does through this suffering and all the good that He does uh, bring out of it. So, I'd like to start this evening uh, with Sue. She is a very bubbly uh, Christian lady, an older Christian lady, but despite her very vivacious personality, she's suffered with depression over the years. And I thought we'd start this evening by um, looking at one of Sue's rather unusual hobbies, because this hobby demonstrates very visibly how God can take the most seemingly worthless thing in our lives and, and turn it into something beautiful and useful. Okay, George and I have been busy this past year with Plarn. This came from Esther Gild at church. And what this is, is plastic bags 
cut in strips, knotted together. George sits on the floor and cuts the bags and knots them together. And then I crochet with plarn, plastic yarn, plarn. Um, we have 5,000 plastic bags in the barn, so if you're interested in learning how to do this, I'll show you. These are mats for earthquake victims in Haiti who are still sleeping on mud. So you ship this, and you just crochet and make a plarn blanket. I've done this by the hour. Turn on the praise music. Crochet blanket. And as you're sitting here, of course, you pray for the people in Haiti. And pray not only for their physical, but that they're spiritual, that they're brought to a life in Christ, too. That's plarn. We're saving the environment. We're not disposing of the plastic bags. We're making plarn. Cute, right? <laughs> God. See how God can take the most worthless and useless of things in our lives and turn them and weave them and put them together to make something beautiful and useful. God works all things, including depression, together for the good of His people. And one of the goods that God brought out of that experience for Sue was God used it to grab her attention. I, I don't have a depressive nature. I, I just don't. Growing up, I was, if I made a pie and burned it, so what? Make another one. I, I don't have a depressed nature. That's why I think the depression was so hard for me to recognize because that's just not who I am. I have an intense personality, I would say, but not a depressive personality. When I look back, I just have to think it was what God had to use in my life. I thank Him for it. I would never wish depression on my worst enemy. I wouldn't. It's awful. But that's how God had to get my attention. Because I just went through life, hmm, this is good. This is happy. Let's all be happy. He had to use that depression to get my attention. And my prayer is that my having been depressed, I can help somebody else. It was for a purpose. I believe that, and I thank him for that purpose. There are many Christians like Sue who can, who can speak of how God used this experience, this suffering of depression to really grab their attention and direct them to himself. Sadly, we need that, don't we? But Sue learned more. Sue learned how to pray. In fact, how to pray without ceasing. She also learned how to depend upon God. I was quite independent. I could do things for myself. I had this relationship with God, but I was in control of it. And I needed my depression to become de more dependent on God. And I, I recognize that. Um, that's not why everybody needs depression. But God does have a purpose He can work out in your life through that depression. Isn't that a wonderful experience to learn how to depend upon God? To, to learn how to lean upon Him? Uh, he weakens us so that we really plant everything upon Him. And then what happens as a result of that is prayer begins in a new way and to a new degree in the Christian life. Tremendous amount of prayer. Just pray continually. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I'm, I've prayed that prayer a million times. Just get me through the next minute. Um, I have to go to the grocery store. Just, just get me back home from the grocery store. Just, and then when I saw improvement, gradual, minimal improvement, I was struck by, God is answering my prayers. 
not in big ways of taking this depression completely away, but he is answering my prayers. I made it to the grocery store. Isn't that a valuable lesson to learn? How to pray without ceasing, praying about the very basic, ordinary, everyday things of life. You see how God can take plastic bags and turn them into beds for the child, the, the fatherless and the homeless, take our worst experiences and transform them into something beautiful and useful. I'd like to turn now to uh, Dr. Eric Johnson, who's the professor of pastoral care at Southern Baptist Seminary. He's, he's helped many Christians through depression, and one of the things he's noticed as he's done this is how it, it deepens Christian maturity. All of us as Christians are on a journey, and some of us are called to a different kind of a journey. And I would put it in this context, I would say a person who has depression, that's a part of their journey. And, and their journey isn't, isn't futile. It isn't purposeless, though it feels like it is often in depression. But that what God is wanting to do is to cause their story to be a story of a special kind of glory that is actually produced through this life of difficulty and the burdens that they bear and the sins that they overcome so that uh, more and more they enter into a kind of wise uh, Christian. And I don't, I don't know about other people, but in, in my experience, I've found that people, in, especially in their 40s and 50s and 60s, that tend to be the deepest kinds of Christians, you often see that it's associated with a measure of suffering that uh, the Lord has used in order to bring them to that kind of state of, of greater maturity in the faith. It deepens Christian maturity. Dr. Johnson is, is very respectful of the insights and resources of secular counseling, but as he tells us in this next clip, the more he's counseled, the more he's realized how much more resources we have who have the power of the gospel. I have to say, there is, there is a lot of value in secular counseling, but it is so impoverished compared to the resources that we have. We, it's like whatever value they have in secular counseling, we got all that, and we have so much more. We have a God who's, who's so committed to our well-being that he was willing to send his son and to die for us and then to be raised from the dead. And now he's up in heaven and saying, come on, folks, come on, my children. I love you. I want your best. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So I am, I am so optimistic. I am hopelessly optimistic with, about the people that I work with. And as the power of the gospel is experienced in the lives of those who are suffering with this weakness, what happens? What happens is, as that power soaks into their lives, they are empowered. Before I they are empowered to witness for the gospel in ways they have not been before. I was depressed. I was very quiet about my relationship with God, with Christ. Um, it wasn't something that I readily shared. Having been through a depression, I just want to share my love for Christ and my thankfulness to God with anyone who will listen, because that's what it's all about. What is this life really worth except striving to glorify God, which, of course, we fall so short. Um, if I hadn't had the depression, I don't think I would have realized that I would have stayed in my keep my Christianity to myself. Of course, people see you take communion, judge you as a Christian, but as far as trumpeting Christ, I wouldn't have done that. I would have kept that to myself. So I'm very thankful for the depression that I can do that now. My depression just opened the floodgates to think, when I came out of it, um, it just opened the floodgates of my love for God, my love for Christ, my relationship with Christ. Um, I just want everyone to have that same relationship and feel that same joy that is available in living for Christ. 
however fall short we fall. I mean, I don't want to sound like this wonderful spiritual Christian per- per- person. I just want to sound like someone who's in love with Christ, and He's my life. Isn't that what we all want to be? You see how God takes ugly plastic bags and turns them into a beautiful witness? But let's turn away from Sue. Let, let's go down a generation. I want to introduce you to Jenny. Now, Jenny smashes all caricatures about depression. She's a lovely, godly Christian mother who's got all her ducks in a row, you might say, and yet God brought depression into her life. And she says the great lesson she learned through it was God's strength is made perfect through weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness was a really big verse for me because I had finally come to the realization that I was weak, but through my weakness, God's strength is, was made so clear to me. You see her husband, Greg, there. He's a pastor. And as he tells us in this next clip, he also learned through depression. You see, God doesn't just teach the sufferer. He teaches those around them as well. Greg learned something about the compassionate heart of God that he didn't know before. This whole journey that we've been on has been such a strengthening thing for our marriage. We've been more open with each other. We just express our feelings more, and he's not so afraid to open up to me because he was kind of worried about how I would react and and stuff like that. But it's really strengthened our marriage that we can um, be honest with each other when we need a when we need a break or when, hey, I'm not feeling so well today, or, you know, we just rely on each other a lot more, and we look mm. to each other for help, and together we look to God for help as well. Yeah, I think we both realize that we need each other more, and so you build off of each other and play off of each other more uh, than what you did before you realized uh, the weaknesses that you had, and you Hopefully, anyways, take the precautions to provide, you know, health for each other. We remind each other, you know, she'll remind me, you can't stay up and read theology till midnight every single night. You can't preach every single week. And, and I'll remind her, you can't say yes to everybody who calls and ask if you can do this or do that or the other thing. And we'll remind each other we need to get away. We should take the kids somewhere. We need to take a weekend off. So in that way, we appreciate each other's limitations and try to protect each other. I think we skipped a clip there, but um, that clip itself shows us how, you know, sometimes when depression comes into a marriage, the, there's a fear this is going to smash us apart. And yet, as Jenny and Greg describe, as I found myself, when my own wife has suffered with it, it, it strengthens Christian marriage in wonderful, wonderful ways. But you know, depression affects all races. And I'd like to introduce you now to a young African American nurse, Tamika, who had a number of painful experiences in her life and eventually sort of lapsed into a, a depression unknown to herself. But again, she, though she may still actually be in it, says that God has used it to teach her the difference between happiness and joy. I'm finding out now that there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based upon something happening, and I never really thought about it like that. Joy is something that um, I read in a book uh, that's called Choose Joy because happiness isn't enough. So as I started to read that book, I came across the definition of what joy was. And it's the settled assurance that God is in control. It's the quiet confidence that everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in all you do. So seek for joy and not happiness. 
I'm sure many of you have learned the difference between joy and happiness, and it's a wonderful difference to learn. Um, sometimes it takes these kinds of, of painful experiences. Uh, Dr. Peter Newhouse is a Christian counselor in Zealand, Michigan, and he's helped many people through depression, and what he's seen in many Christians' lives is how it it helps them become better servants. It makes them serve others better. There's something greater here. There's a greater hope. There's a greater opportunity than just getting well or feeling better. There's a joy. There's a hopefulness. There's just an opportunity to impact other people. It goes beyond just me, not only when I'm depressed, but then when I'm not depressed or recovering from depression, I can speak into other people's lives and really have an impact. And I think so often secular counseling says if I feel good or I'm happy, that's the end game. And for me, and how I counsel, and specifically with depressed people, is going, what does this mean, bigger picture, for other people and other people's lives? and even lifelong or into eternity, what's this mean? And I think as people are depressed, they have less opportunity to minister and impact people's lives. And as they get healthier and more whole and have joy in their lives, they're more able to just impact their, their spouses, their children, and those that are in their sphere of influence. And one of the ways that God uses depression to make us better servants is he uses depression to help us become better counselors of others. And I'd like to return to Dr. Eric Johnson because he talks in this next clip about his own wife's depression and how through that she became the professor's professor. I have to say, uh, in my own life, the single most important source of my own counseling wisdom has been my wife that God brought into my life who struggled with depression off and on throughout her life. And I was useless to her in the early years of our marriage, and I was such a problem solver and a fixer. Uh, but gradually, God gave me grace, and, and I didn't hurt my wife so bad that she wouldn't stay with me and, and, and work with me and, in a way, help me to become more effective. But I'm deeply grateful to God for, for the, the, uh, the things that God taught me through her. So um, I, I think if you can look, if a, if a caregiver can look at it as, a, as an opportunity to, to become more skillful, then, then you, can, you can approach the depressed person and say, you know, when I, if I say something that's really dumb, you let me know because I want to be helpful to you. I want to be an encouragement to you. I want to be, you, and you're the only one that can let me know how to how to do that and to, to look at the depressed person kind of as a resource in that way. What, what will be most helpful to you uh, as I walk with you? Let me know. One thing I've found myself in dealing with uh, depressed people is how much riches there are in God's Word for helping those with depression. But I've also learned how many riches there are in God's world, and only a Scotsman can say it like that. Yes, we have great riches in God's Word, but by common grace, we have tremendous riches in God's world as well. And one of these, as Pastor Tabitiania Wheelie makes clear in this next clip, is medication. One of the things we want to do as pastors is make a, um, an assessment as to whether or not we're dealing with a kind of spiritual depression, uh, or whether we're dealing with a clinical depression. We want to know what the roots are, the contributory factors are to the depression. Now, on the, on the spiritual side, it could be any number of things, uh, from uh, a misunderstanding of the nature of God uh, and His character and how He's acting in a person's life, to unrepentant sin, to unconfessed sin, um, to not partake, partake, partaking of the means of grace uh, in the local church. Uh, but on the clinical side, we're talking about things that uh, may have medical roots, uh, may have chemical roots, uh, probably going to need a, a, a whole other level of treatment, kind of treatment from the medical world, which is, which is really God's grace to us. Um, and so may involve medication and other things that uh, help to address um, the imbalance that's happening uh, that contributes to the depression. Wonderful riches in both God's Word and... God's world. But let's go back to 
Dr. Peter Newhouse again, he's seen um, significant spiritual growth through depression, and especially in this area, in becoming an example to other believers. And, you know, when you're in depression, that, you just think you are the worst Christian in the world, don't you? You just, you think you're a complete failure, a complete disaster, you're letting everybody down, including your Lord and Savior. And yet, in God's great wisdom and power, He can, through it, equip you to be a wonderful example, an inspiration to others, as Peter Newhouse makes so clear here. So often depression actually prompts people to grow in different ways. It forces them to lean on God, other people, and just learn different skills that maybe they've ever used or had to learn. And so depression can actually be a real blessing in a roundabout way if people persevere. So I've often seen people really grow in their faith and understanding of who God is and really, again, depend on God in unique and different ways that maybe if they hadn't experienced depression, that they wouldn't have. And again, they may be people of faith already, but their faith is deepened and it goes in a completely different way or in a completely different depth than they've ever had before. I think their relationships oftentimes can be really enriched because they're depending on that support person and that support person gets to love them and care for them in ways maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. So that's a really powerful opportunity as well to really lean on other people as a depressed person and then have those support people care for them, love them in a variety of ways that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise, which deepens that marriage or that relationship. And then I think also just when we're struggling with difficult things, in this case we're talking about depression, but when we're struggling with any difficult thing, there's an opportunity for us to grow in our character in a variety of ways, whether it's perseverance or long-suffering or really learn the real meaning of joy. I think we can talk about joy, but it's really not tested unless you really face something difficult and still choose joy. And so a lot of depressed people that I've dealt with actually are great examples of joy and especially in the midst of trial and tribulation. So a lot of people I look to and go, wow, they're who I want to be, and they've grown in incredible ways, are actually people that have struggled with some type of abuse, which resulted in depression. And through that, they've really grown and changed and become this amazing person. And I think they also can minister to other people in extraordinary ways because they understand and they have that depth of their character to know what it takes to overcome it. And it's one thing to talk about, hey, this can really be a great opportunity for you to grow and change and be challenged, but to actually be a person that's done that and telling someone else about it is powerful. And so I've loved watching other people that I've helped with depression minister to other people and share their story and share the positive impact it's had on their life. Because oftentimes we just assume it's a negative impact or a down thing. And it's actually it can be a huge positive impact on that person and on other relationships. Tamika takes up this theme of being an example to others. And she has noticed how depression has helped her to become a much better mentor of other young African-American women that she teaches in the Grand Rapids Community College. I, I probably wouldn't change a thing. It's made me the stronger person that I am. It's made me to be able to mentor to other students, tell that story, and um, give people the hope that they need to move forward. You know, setbacks are going to happen, you know. If I can catch just that one student that's, you know, from going over to that edge, you know, with my story, then I know that things I've gone through is not in vain. The things I've gone through are not... The times for me. The things I've gone through are not in vain. That's a wonderful reassurance for the Christian, isn't it? It's James Dobson, Dr. James Dobson, who said, there's nothing wasted in God's economy. Sometimes depression looks like a waste. God doesn't waste it. And, and all this, you know, trying to emphasize the positive things that come out of depression, it's not to deny the pain of it. There are deep and dark and long valleys, as Pastor Paul Totchus explains from his own experience. Exactly times for me. Uh, They are, they are so long. Sometimes these, these dark nights are, are so long, I don't know how, it seems like they'll go on forever. 
And yet when, when I come out of it, there is something significantly different about me. I am different. I, I understand myself better. I understand my fallenness. I understand the image of God in me. I understand my relationship to God. But I understand God better. Deep and dark valleys, but I understand God better. And one of the reasons that happens is because what's in the head sinks down to the heart through times of suffering. What, what is merely theoretical becomes functional, as Paul again explains. Every time I go through one of these times, I come out seeing him more loving, more gracious, more merciful, more patient, and I end up being more in awe that he and his grace would choose to save me, that, that Christ would willingly bear the penalty for my sin, that I may be a child of God. I, I know that for some Christians, this sounds like such simple truths that maybe they understood it in the first couple of years that, that they were a believer, but it's taken me, I'm a, I've been a believer 28 years, it's taken me this long to come to, to understand these things in a functional way. Yes, I've known for a long time. I am a child of God. I am secure in Christ. I am accepted by God already in Christ. But when I look at my Christian life, I have not functioned that way. Theory becomes reality. In the second last clip, I want to introduce you to Annika, a teenage girl who's had a tremendous number of losses in her life. It's just just a miracle of grace that she is still standing, this dear young girl. And yet, as you'll hear, God has used this to give her a sense of purpose in her life, something that's very, very rare amongst teenagers today. At first, um, I guess I was kind of like, I don't want other people knowing, just because I don't want their, their opinions on it and for them to judge me. But now I, I see that there are a lot of people out there that are hiding it, and they do need help. And like, I feel like if I can be open, maybe they'll come out too and try and get help. I didn't realize how many people had depression until like, I got to like, talk to someone about it, and they're like, well, there are a lot of people in the world that are depressed. And you can't always see that that person is depressed. Um, even if it's your best friend. I guess it kind of like makes me feel like I have a purpose in life. I really do love helping people. I believe Annika will go on and put 2 Corinthians 1 into practice, that the comfort with which she has been comforted of God, she will go on and comfort others with. I want to finish though with her own counselor, just a wonderful, godly, Christian lady, Dr. Emily de Young, who has helped so many teenage girls through these traumatic years. And as she's observed all these girls pass through her, her, her office, she says what keeps striking her is the power of the sympathy and the salvation of Christ. Each person of the Trinity is vital when we're talking about the healing from depression. But I do believe that there is a unique power in when we're talking about God the Son, because the Bible tells us that Jesus is not unfamiliar with our weaknesses. He recognizes that we suffer, and He suffered, and He has empathy towards the things that we suffer with. And if I picture my Savior on the cross, and I picture the things that He suffered, he knew what it meant to be human. He knew what it meant to deal with weakness in an overwhelming sense of despair. 
He was forsaken by God, and yet he overcame death for you. And that's powerful when we're looking at depression because one of the things that is lost in the depressive process is a sense of hope. And when I serve a Savior who can overcome death, that gives me hope that even the weight of depression can be lifted from my life. Are you convinced all things for good? God uses depression to teach us that all things work together for good. He uses it to grab our attention. He uses it to make us depend upon Him more. He uses it to make us pray without ceasing. He uses it to deepen our spirituality. He uses it to teach us the power, the optimistic power and value of the gospel. He uses it to empower our own witness. He uses it to teach us His strength is made perfect in our weakness. He uses it to teach us His compassion at heart. He uses it even to strengthen marriages. He uses it to teach us the difference between joy and happiness. He uses it to teach us to serve others better. He uses it to teach us how to counsel others better. He uses it to help us discover the riches in God's Word and in His world. He uses it to make us a spiritual example to others and a mentor of people who really need us. He teaches us about Himself in the valley. He makes the theoretical become functional. He uses it to give us a purpose in life, and He uses it to teach us the power of the sufferings and the sympathy and the salvation of Jesus Christ. He gives beauty for ashes. He takes plastic bags and transforms them into not just beds for the, child, for the fatherless and the homeless, but into beautiful Christian graces and gifts in His people. He works all things together for good. Where suffering abounds, there His grace much more abounds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray, for being here with us. I would want uh, everyone to know here that we have your book, Christians Get Depressed Too, over in the bookstore. Can we put up a picture of that so everybody can see? There it is. So you know what you're looking for over there in the bookstore. Uh, I fear that based on the attendance of this session that we didn't bring enough, <laughs> but we'll get it out to you, and I'm sure you can pick some up on Amazon as well. If you'd like to follow along with Dr. Murray's ministry, this new resource, when do you expect it to come out? Well, if any of you know publishers, it will still be probably another year or more, okay. but um, any publishers out there, come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> but they can keep up with you on your website as well, and yeah. that's headhearthand.org. That's right. Headhearthand.org. He publishes daily on his blog, uh, has a lot of helpful resources there as well, and, and even this series, you know, you've got some material there yeah. from that. Well, just as R.C. Sproul Jr. Uh, was able to meet you at this conference for the first time, this was obviously an opportunity for you to express uh, your friendship uh, with him mm -hmm. now in person. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, could you return the favor of introducing him for this next session? I'd love to. Okay. I'd love to. Thank you. 